Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. This is episode 52. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Suzuma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Good day to you, Doc. Hello, Christina. How are you? Very good, thank you. Good. Greetings, everybody, and welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I am Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your host today, along with Christina, as we travel through another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy, searching for optimal health. Today, we're going inside the doctor's bag again, Christina. Oh, we're going to go exploring on an adventure, that means. <laughs> yes, we have some journeys to go on. That's true. There's going to be some science and chemistry and physiology and maybe some anatomy. So uh, people should get out there pencil and paper or their uh, iPhone or iPad or whatever people <laughs> can do things on these days, maybe just mentally. Uh, I'm assuming there will probably be some questions that people have as we go along this show because we're going to be talking about vital signs. We always hear about it and try and define it a little for everyone, give you ideas of what it's about and uh, learn some things as we go along. So just in case people have a question along the way, how do they get in touch with us? Yes, if you have a question or a comment, um, if you are watching it through online or through the Internet, you can scroll down just a little on your screen, and there's a little comment box uh, below that. Just type in your question or comment and click Submit, and it will show up on our screen on, the, on this side, and I will read it to Dr. Woolman. And for those of you who may be listening by the phone or... If you would like to ask your make your comment or ask your question personally, you can call in to our conference line, which is 323-476-3672. The PIN is 607393-POUND. And this number will show up for you during the show and um, uh, sporadically, so that uh, if you haven't written it down the first time, it shall be on your screen. Okay, so, and we look forward to this, Dr. Woolman. Well, good. Yeah, these are fun for me. I like to do this because normally when we have a guest, uh, I usually at this time give a pathway that I'm going to hopefully go on with them. But since there's no one else, I'm, I'm going to talk about some purposes today rather than a pathway. And Part of the purpose is to give people knowledge of what's going on inside their bodies. But it's really, I think, about recruiting people. And what I mean by that is recruiting people to become more aware of what they're about anatomically, physiologically, what the body is about. And by knowing more about the body, the consciousness of taking care of it will probably come mm. into play a lot more. So the more that people know the more they can be involved in their own care. But it goes beyond that a little bit, too. Uh, we're going to be talking about vital signs today, so you should be always concerned about your own vital signs, and I'll explain it in a little while. But there'll be times that you might have to uh, take care of one of your children and take their temperature or uh, a pulse that might be helpful during an infection or something, uh, a serious illness or on medication. And it's good to know that for others. And sometimes also you'll be visiting people in a hospital, uh, a relative or a friend, and you may see them on a monitor. And this way you'll get an understanding of some of the things that are going on on the monitor, which will give you an idea. Usually they're about vital signs of some kind. And that'll give you an idea of how the person is in front of you. So if you happen to be concerned about that person and the doctor or nurse walks in, as you know a little more about the vital signs, then you may be able to ask more directed, specific questions that will get you engaged in the whole process. So I, that's my purpose today a little bit. Mm, that's the fun, because that, th this is something we can do, use uh, on a daily, a daily. A daily level, right? Like, because we're around so many people all the time and to track ourselves, right? Yes, and we should be doing a little assessment on ourselves. Uh, so let me just say, first of all, there's a difference between symptoms and signs. That's why we don't, don't call them vital symptoms. We call them vital signs. Symptoms 
or something that you have as a feeling. I don't feel well. I feel queasy. Uh, I have pain in my chest. Uh, those kind of things. So if I said those things to you, you would not be able to really rate that or have a great understanding of it. Uh, but if I said to you, my pulse is uh, 60, then you would have an instant understanding exactly of what my heartbeat is, and you would be able to react to that if my pulse was 120 or, or it was 30. Signs are things that you can actually measure and follow by monitoring to see how someone is doing. So when we call vital signs, these are the things that are important for us uh, to determine that someone is actually alive, vitality. These are pulse, blood pressure, respirations, and now we've added pulse oximetry and we have temperature. And we'll go through each of these. And then I want to add at the end, we have some time, two other assessment uh, processes, but they're not signs. They're more like symptoms that we should be looking at. And those are uh, pain and happiness. So here we go. <clears throat> Before we actually understand vital signs, I want to uh, give everyone a picture of the cardiac cycle. So I need you to kind of close your eyes a little bit and picture that you're a red blood cell down uh, on the bottom of the foot, maybe by, by the bubbling well or the, uh, between the second and third toes, uh, somewhere on a foot near a red blood cell in a capillary. And we're going to uh, take a tour right now of the cardiac cycle to see where this red blood cell goes. So it, it's in a capillary and it's conversing and communicating with a cell down in your foot. It could be a bone cell or a nerve or a ligament or uh, a fat cell, something like that. And as the heart beats, it moves that red blood cell along with its buddies uh, into out of the capillaries and into really small veins. And the veins become like uh, tributaries on the top of a mountain where they start to flow into a larger creek and then a stream and then a river. And that's what happens. The uh, red blood cell flows from the capillary into these small veins then into larger veins. And finally, if it's coming from the bottom or the lower half of the body below the heart, it arrives into one very large vein. It's called the inferior vena cava. So it's a large vein, but it's coming from inferior. If it's coming, if the red blood cell happened to start out in the top of the head or in the ear or in a finger, then it would go through the capillary into the smaller veins, into the larger veins, finally into the biggest large vein, which would be the superior vena cava. So you have these two giant veins that take all the blood coming from the different parts of the body, and they empty them into the right side of the heart. And when we talk about right side of the heart, you would have to imagine as if it were you were inside your own body looking out. So if you look down at your heart, the right side would be on your right, and the left side obviously on the left, not as if you were looking at somebody directly. So the red blood cell, along with the other blood, flow through the uh, large veins into uh, a chamber, the upper right chamber, and then through a valve system to keep blood flowing in one way into a lower right chamber. And this all happens when the heart relaxes. When the heart fills up with blood and it squeezes down and pushes the blood out, that blood that's in the right chamber goes through an artery. Arteries leave the heart. Veins enter the heart. So it goes into the pulmonary artery where it then goes up finally into a capillary where the uh, cell picks up oxygen. And we will talk about that a little down the road. And then it goes back into a venous system, back into veins, where it goes into the left upper chamber, eventually goes through a valve system or a system of docks or, or doors that keep it again going in one way, and it goes down into the left lower chamber as the heart is relaxing. When the heart squeezes, it goes out through the biggest artery in the heart called the aorta, 
and then it makes its way down into other arteries. They get uh, smaller and smaller and eventually become a capillary again, uh, and then they end up back at the toe. So that's the tour that you take. You go through the capillary, through the veins, into the right side of the heart, up through the lungs to get the oxygen, back into the left side of the heart, and then the heart squeezes and pushes the blood out through arteries, and then smaller arteries, capillaries, and it, and it makes a cycle. And this cycle happens. Um, if you had a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, so it would take one second for that heartbeat to do that whole cycle, to push the blood each time, receiving the, receiving the blood from the right side veins and, and pushing the blood out through the left side arteries. Uh, any questions on that, Christina? Well, that was quite a tour. <laughs> yeah, it's a great tour. Now, if you, decide, if you decide to take the tour on your own at another point, you could be a white blood cell or a platelet or anything you want, but I needed you to be a red blood cell for uh, certain purposes as, as we move forward. Mm -hmm. So this happens you know, every day, every minute. Our heart is beating, and it's relaxing and squeezing blood and relaxing and contracting and relaxing and contracting at a certain rate. And that's an effective rate that we need to keep us functioning and um, doing all the things that we do. So as we go through uh, checking vital signs and talking about vital signs, understand that what I really want you to do as you learn this is to practice this all the time. Practice it on yourself, practice on other people, uh, practice on your children, so that you really get an understanding that there may not be one specific number. There's a general ballpark figure. We know a general range of pulse, for example, as we learn how to take the pulse, it's within a normal range. There's slower, there's faster. And as you practice taking a pulse, you will learn uh, the differences. And the more people you practice on, you'll learn that it changes. All of the vital signs can change uh, with age, with sex, with weight, with exercise, uh, with uh, hormonal changes, with menstrual cycles and ovulation, a number of things. So I'd like to start with the pulse. And we can show a picture of uh, where you can take a pulse. A pulse, as we know now, is uh, something that's generated from the heartbeat that forces the blood to go through an artery. So when we're taking our pulse, we're taking it from an artery. We have a picture here that shows how to use two fingers of your right hand and go to your left hand between the bone that goes from the elbow to the forearm and uh, on the thumb side, on the inside of the wrist rather than on the outside. And as you learn to take the pulse, you, you may have to push in a little hard at first, but then learn to do it as lightly as possible. So what do we look for in taking a pulse? There are three things that we look for. We look for a rate, a rhythm, and a description. So let's go through each of those uh, very quickly. As you're taking the pulse, you need to count it in terms of a full minute. I always suggest a full minute. When I was in the emergency department and I didn't always have a full minute, I might take it for 15 seconds, and then whatever number I felt number of beats I felt in that 15 seconds, I would multiply it by four to give it a full minute. But I always like to tell people to try and take it for a full minute. And when we're looking, you just feel and start counting for that minute. A normal heart rate or a normal pulse rate is usually between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Athletes can certainly go under that uh, when they're resting and, and athletes when they're excited or exerting themselves can go over that. But it's a good idea to learn uh, what your normal pulse is. And again, it can change in the morning, in the afternoon, if you're eating, a number of things. If you have a fever, a lot of different reasons. But get to know how your pulse feels and figure out the rate. So that's the first thing you take on a person uh, is the rate and try and make that in beats per minute. So I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Depending on the age of the individual. For example, I, I, I was just baffled when um, 
when I first heard a, a baby's heartbeat, because it was like twice the speed of mine. <laughs> it was like, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This um, like, wow, I feel like my baby's going to explode. It's going to do, 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 do. <laughs> Yes, we do. We do have some science that tells us general ranges for a uh, uh, baby inside uh, the uterus could be up to 140, 150 wow. beats per minute. Uh, eventually to an adult where it goes to about 60 beats per minute. Mm. Uh, and people can look at uh, their number of different charts that people can find that will tell them uh, what it would be uh, for the age of their baby. And then as they learn how to uh, check it, uh, they will get to know the variations. You can also check the pulse in many different places. Uh, on the wrist, that's the radial pulse. You could check it up by the carotid artery, which is uh, an area in the neck just below the angle of the jaw and between that muscle that turns the neck. Feel it there. Mm -hmm. There's pulses in the elbow, the brachial artery. There's pulses in the groin, the femoral arteries. You can feel a pulse behind the knees, the popliteal arteries. You can feel pulses around the ankle, uh, the tibialis, uh, anterior tibialis or posterior tibialis, and then you can feel them also on the foot, the dorsalis pedis. These are all things that we learn, and sometimes uh, for different reasons. Uh, if I was working on somebody's foot uh, with a trauma victim, uh, sometimes I may not have the time to go up to their uh, wrist or chest, uh, and I may just feel for the pulse uh, by the foot. There's also uh, many other reasons to feel for a pulse. It gives you an indication that there is a blood pressure, and it also tells you that blood is coming to an area. For example, if somebody dislocates their shoulder, uh, they may hurt the blood supply, and you would want to feel for a pulse there, not because of the heartbeat, but because you want to make sure that the rest of the hand has a blood supply, and that gives you an indication if you do feel a pulse then you have a little bit of time to get the shoulder back into its normal socket. Mm. If you don't feel a pulse, it becomes much more of an emergency. So mm. there are many reasons to feel a pulse, uh, not just uh, for a heartbeat. So we've mm. got the rate, right? The next thing is an interesting one called the rhythm. And let me explain this to you. If you think of a heartbeat going at 60 beats per minute, it would probably sound like, That's a, we would call that a regular rhythm, okay? So what other things are there besides an, a regular rhythm? Well, there are irregular rhythms. So one type of an irregular rhythm is an irregular rhythm that has a regularity to it. And that would sound something like this. Bump, bump, a bump, 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 a bump. Um, you can see that that's irregular, but it, it seems to have a regularity to it, right? And then the third rhythm that you would hear would be one that is irregular and irregularly irregular. So it would be something like bump, 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 bump. Do those uh, three different ones make sense to you, Christina? The regular, the regularly irregular, and mm -hmm. the irregularly irregular? <laughs> that was really it all tough. sounds I, quite regular to me. me. <laughs> please tell me you got that so I don't have to say those words again. I did get it. I did get it. I, I, uh, that's, that was actually very clear. Um, I didn't realize that. Well, I, I've heard of the irregular heartbeat or the irregular rhythm. You know, isn't that called arrhythmia or something like that? Is that arrhythmia? Yes, dysrhythmias or arrhythmias. When it's not a normal rhythm, it's an arrhythmia. Mm. So that arrhythmia can be either, uh, it can be either, oh, I have to say it again. <laughs> <laughs> You're making me say it again. You say is it the this irregular, time. Is the irregular irregular? Is right. the uh, arrhythmia? <laughs> There, see, okay, it's not Peter, easy pick being, a peck of pickle pepper. <laughs> not easy playing a doctor. Uh, you mean you were just acting all this time? <laughs> yeah. 
Now, the, <laughs> anything that's not a normal rhythm is an arrhythmia. Okay. And what is so the other one be, called? There's regular rhythm. Yes. There's regularly irregular. And there's irregularly irregular. Got that? The one that was uh, irregular, regular, that's arrhythmia. arrhythmia. There, anything that's not a normal rhythm is an arrhythm. Okay. So it's an arrhythmia. If but, it's normal, it's not an arrhythmia. But what if, if it's irregular but regular? Then it's an arrhythmia. It's still an arrhythmia. Okay. If it's not regular, if it has any irregularity to it, right. then it's an arrhythmia. Okay. Oh. All right. So we've got the rate and we've got the rhythm. There's one other part. This is called the description or the quality. Now, in Chinese medicine, uh, which has a whole different pulse therapy than we do, uh, they have many descriptions. But for the sake of simplicity, I like to describe a pulse with just it, to make it easy for everyone it, with four possibilities. One, if you try to feel a pulse and you don't feel a pulse, that's a description. It's called it's absent, right? It, there is no pulse that you can feel. And that could happen either if no one, someone does not have a heartbeat or because they've dislocated the blood supply and there is no uh, pulse at that point. So it can be absent. The mm. second thing is it can be weak. You can barely feel it. This could be someone who's very close to dying uh, or somebody who has lost a lot of blood for many different reasons. You could feel a pulse, but it just doesn't feel like that normal pulse that you're used to because you've listened to this talk and you've practiced. The third is a normal beat. You just get an idea. There, you could feel blood rushing through it. it. It raises your fingertips a little bit, and it's easy to feel, and it's easy to count, and it's easy to feel the rhythm. And then the fourth one is just explosive, where it's, it's practically pushing your fingers off of the body part or off of the artery. Ooh. And each of, yeah, That's each like of them, after a, a really a run or some really something very physical? Right, after something like that. Or it could be something pathological where someone has an aneurysm or they're uh, rupturing their heart or something, or they've taken... Uh, a medication such as methamphetamine or uh, something that may affect their heart rate really hard. Mm. So you got that? We're on the pulse? I did. So far, okay. so good. Let, now, good. now uh, 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 a question came in. Okay. Because this is about the pulse. Correct. Now, the que I, I guess the question is to, um, to break it down, where... When did society begin to learn how to take a pulse? Because, like, way back when, um, uh, sometime, uh, way back when, as in depicted in certain, like, television or movies, they would use, like, a mirror or a sword or something of that, uh, a piece of metal to put in front of someone's face to see if there was still breath coming out. But they you don't see them taking a pulse. Do you, Correct. would you know when this came to be that in history? There's history, there's many historical uh, pieces of the ancient Greeks, Galen took a pulse, uh, Hippocrates, mm -hmm. uh, Asclepius, they all took a pulse. They were learning about the pulse. They had different uh, theories on what it was, but they were taking a pulse. The Egyptians appeared to be doing that. Mm. Uh, so it goes back to ancient times. Mm -hmm. But what's happened is our monitoring systems are better. So now if you put someone on a monitor, you don't even have to take a pulse. You can get much more information from the electrocardiogram monitor <laughs> telling so many things. It'll tell you what arrhythmia or rhythm it is. It'll tell you the rate, things like that, uh, many things. Mm. So, uh, so that I hope that answers that question. Yes, and I we're going to get into respirations, but we have blood pressure now mm. that I want to talk about. Now, blood pressure is something that if you don't have the equipment, you can't take it. Whereas the pulse, 
you have the equipment, assuming you have fingers or uh, and the ability to count, uh, you can take a pulse. But blood pressure, you can't. And I just want to talk a, a few moments about blood pressure because this is more like the part when you're going to the hospital or you hear that your doctor says you have this over this and you don't remember which is which. Uh, it, it comes usually in two numbers. There's a systolic and a diastolic. Uh, there's the upper number and the lower number. Now, uh, I was trying to uh, think of a way that I could get people to remember that. And while I was thinking about it, I was watching uh, our pope being elected in the uh, Sistine Chapel in Rome. And I was thinking, well, if you think of cis, like Sistine, that's above. You know, it's in the Sistine ceiling is up or it's above. So you could think systolic is the one that's above. And the diastolic, which is the number below, if you think if somebody dies, they go underground or they're, they're buried under. So those might be simple ways, hopefully, to remember systolic, cysteine is the ceiling and die is diastolic uh, under or below. And usually it's represented, a normal would be something like 100 over 80. The, there are different variations on what's considered high blood pressure and low blood pressure. Uh, but in the systolic, usually you want to keep your blood pressure at the systolic range, which is which one, Christina, the, the upper or the lower? Uh, the, the, the upper, the, the higher number. Correct. So uh, the, you want to keep that between 100 and 120. If you start going over 120, it's a good idea to see your doctor. Mm. Uh, the lower number, the diastolic, you want to keep it below 90. So if your blood pressure is 100 over 60, you're doing great. If your blood pressure is 120 over 80, you're doing great. If your blood pressure is 130 over 90, you need to talk to your doctor. And the higher up it goes, uh, the more important it is to figure it out. But what is systolic and what is diastolic? Just so that you'll have a, a, a clue as to what that means. Well, remember the lower number, the diastolic. Okay, that's under 90. Uh, when we talked about that cardiac cycle, remember when we talked about the heart when it was relaxing? Well, when the heart is relaxed, the amount of pressure that's being forced on the walls of the blood vessels, pushing from the inside to the outside, that lowest resting pressure is the diastolic pressure that's always being put. So if you have uh, a diastolic pressure of 90 millimeters of mercury. It's that amount of pressure that the blood is forcing out to the walls of the artery. Wow. And, uh, right. And when the heart contracts, remember we talked about the heart contracting. If you picture like a balloon that's being filled with water, it starts out relaxed and, and as it expands and fills up with water, when it gets to a point that the muscles, tissues, and cells have stretched so much that they need to squeeze down and contract, it's that final force that uh, the most maximum force that's necessary to push that blood through the valves and out of the heart into the aorta and the large arteries that we discussed uh, to go. So that pressure is the highest pressure that the arteries have to deal with uh, as the cycle continues. So the higher your pressure goes up, the more pressure is being put on those walls and the harder it is for the blood to be pushed through if you have something like arterial sclerosis or cholesterol plaques or narrowing of your arteries. The heart has to push as hard to maintain the blood pressure so that blood can flow to every cell and, and function. Mm, so, so, so we are still talking about the diastolic right the now. The diastolic is the, the resting lower pressure. Right. The systolic, which is the upper number, yes. is the pressure when the heart squeezes down, the amount of pressure needed to contract those, that, those muscles to push the blood out of the heart into the arteries is the diastolic. The pressure has to go higher than the diastolic, which is the resting pressure. Okay. When, it, when the heart goes through a cycle, 
it goes through relaxation, contraction, relaxation, contraction, relaxation, contraction. When it's relaxed, there is a certain amount of pressure in the heart. When it's contracting, there's a higher amount of pressure. That's why the systolic is the higher and that's above. Yes, no? Yes, now I've got it. I was getting the two confused. Yes, and that's why we're having this talk, so that when people can go into the hospital and see their loved one on a monitor and they can see where it says cis over die and then you have two numbers, you will understand that the higher systolic cysteine ceiling is the amount of pressure needed to push blood through the heart. And when we see people with low blood pressure, that's causing problems. When we see people with high blood pressure, that's causing problems. Mm. So we need to be aware of it and uh, and deal with that. Mm-hmm. The In fact, the, the Greek words, and you talk about when did we know this, uh, Greek for diastole, uh, diastole comes from the Greek word, which means uh, separating or moving apart. So when the the heart is relaxed and filling slowly with blood. It's relaxed. So that's diastole. Systole, or uh, from the Greek, comes from bringing together or squeezing. Mm-hmm. So when someone is said to have high blood pressure, correct. That means the systolic is high because it, it, it the numbers are up because it needs um, uh, more pressure to push out that blood from the heart. Correct. Now it also, uh, and again, we're talking about what you need to know versus what the doctor treating you needs to know. On a more deeper level, uh, both of them could be high blood pressure. So you could have 200 over 120. Mm. So, so both of them are really high, and that's still high blood pressure. Um, if either one gets too high, and we're learning more about those numbers uh, that teach us different things, but uh, Yes, when it's over a certain point, it's it's called hypertension, and it's when it's below a certain point, it's called hypotension. Mm-hmm. Other than that, it's normal tension. <laughs> <laughs> What's your blood pressure? Normal tension. <laughs> normal tension. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's probably uh, utensia. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so that a third. Do you want to go on? Or oh, you... yes. Okay, so let's talk about respirations. Respirations or the respiratory rate is uh, the amount of breaths one takes uh, in a minute. Now, this is very interesting because just like the blood pressure, you really can't take your own respirations because as soon as you think about it, you start changing your respiratory rate. So a person cannot take their own uh respiratory rate. In fact, Lao Tzu in the 4th century BC said, the perfect man breathes as if he is not breathing. And that means that if you're breathing normally, you don't know that you're breathing. And if you're looking at someone else, you don't know that they're breathing. It's people that you're aware of their breath, that it's abnormal. And again, the, the amount of rate is usually somewhere between 12 and 20 per minute. So you can look at somebody and you could look at their chest rise, or or if you're carrying a sword, you could put it under their nose or a mirror. Uh, If somebody is unconscious, you come on someone unconscious, but they might be breathing. You could look at their chest or abdomen rising and you would count for a full minute number of breaths. And that's the respiratory rate. But it you can also get uh, more descriptive. Sometimes people have regular rhythms of, of breathing, in, out, in, out, in, out. Sometimes people have irregular rhythms of breathing that are irregularly regular. And then people also have uh, irregular, irregular. breathing. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. <laughs> that is so helpful to me. <laughs> Uh, yes, exactly. And that tells me you got that. So normally, uh, again, this changes by age. Somebody, a child uh, that might be uh, just born might be breathing 30 to 60 breaths a minute, whereas an adult may be breathing 15 uh, breaths a minute. So it's also good to look at how they're breathing. Uh, does it? Can you hear noises or sounds, wheezes or 
uh, you know, like a snoring sound. Those are things to recognize. And as you practice these things uh, on other people, you'll start to learn what appears to be within a normal range and what appears to be not a normal range. So I don't want to talk about respirations too much unless there's a specific question you have because I want to get on to a few other things. Um, I, you know, I'm going to let you continue before I ask you this question that has come up here. <laughs> okay. Uh, there's, a, there's a new one called pulse oximetry uh, uh, that we measure. First of all, I want to say, remember the reason I told you to think of yourself as a red blood cell? Uh, that was for the uh, part of this was for this part of the talk. A red blood cell uh, has a molecule in it called hemoglobin. Have you ever heard of that molecule? Yes. Surprisingly. Okay. So what is, <laughs> what is that? I said surprisingly. Yes. No, a lot of people have heard of that. We've all watched uh, ER and hospital shows. And so we've learned a few things over the years. So what is hemoglobin? Hemoglobin is a molecule. And imagine it uh, at, like a lobster with two pincers. And what it does is when the red blood cell, remember we said it goes through the capillary, goes all the way up to the right side of the heart, goes into the lungs. Uh, and at the point in the lungs, when you breathe in air, you breathe it in through your nose or mouth, it goes into the trachea, it breaks up into the right side or the left side, and then it goes into this, just like the veins, they get smaller and smaller, the airways get smaller and smaller till they almost become the size of a capillary. And at that junction, the capillary with the red blood cell and the hemoglobin with two pincers uh, comes near the oxygen molecules. It grabs onto these molecules and carries them around waiting to go through the heart and be pushed out through the arteries back into the capillaries to get to cells. And then the pincers release the oxygen and the blood cells get their oxygen. And we now have a way of measuring that outside the skin, a non-invasive monitoring system called pulse oximetry. So oh that gosh. just tells us the, yeah, now we could measure it by putting a needle right into an artery and, and measuring the blood there. That's invasive though. But we can actually measure this uh, just by putting this thing. You now see them, they put a clip over your fingertip or on an earlobe mm -hmm. and you hear something like pulse oximetry. And this is the amount of essential saturation of the oxygen uh, in the hemoglobin. So normally we like to see someone in the 95 to 98 range. Uh, this also helps us in monitoring people. Uh, it's good in intensive care units, good in emergency departments, uh, operating rooms where we might be concerned about uh, someone's oxygen level. Also a pilot in a, a non-pressurized cabin may want to do pulse oximetry on them to uh, measure to make sure they don't need oxygen. We also use pulse oximetry in case we are doing oxygen therapy to monitor it to see that it's working. So that's the pulse oximetry. Again, that's not something you're going to measure unless you have a machine, but you, um, if you go into a hospital and you see something that says PO2 uh, or SPO2, P is uh, the pressure and O2 is oxygen, uh, if you see a number like 95, then you know that whoever is under that number, uh, being hooked up to that number, is doing okay. So that's pulse oximetry. Any quick question on that? Well, that's fun. I thought I thought that little um, that little thing that they clipped to your finger was for to measure the respiratory rate. Uh, they're getting much more. Uh, they're getting much more sophisticated. Now they can measure the pulse also, and they can, uh, sometimes there are other pieces of equipment that measures respiratory rate. Mm. Interesting. But yes, it's, it's becoming much more sophisticated. It's like taking, Next, a it's like taking the temperature. It's I'm so glad you brought that up. So ridiculous. Because, <laughs> because that's the next one. We're going to talk about the temperature. Uh, this is something that you could take, and this is something that everyone should take on themselves. There are many ways to take a temperature. Uh, the normal temperature uh, of a person, and again, this is a ballpark figure. It's around 97.8 degrees Fahrenheit or around 37 degrees uh, Celsius or centigrade. Uh, but again, these are just ballpark figures. They again change at time of day. 
uh, during activity, whether you're eating or drinking or smoking a cigarette, uh, whether you're ovulating or menstruating, whether you're on medications, many things change the temperature. So I always tell people to start learning about the temperature when you're normal, because part of the reason to take a temperature is to know when something is abnormal. We take vital signs in the hopes that everything is normal and a person is doing well, but we also use vital signs to recognize when there's pathology or pathophysiology, illness, injury, things like that. And those are the guidelines that help us to try and get back to normal vital signs. So people taking, uh, people having a fever, uh, and they're taking medication, you take the temperature to see if the medication's working or if it's not working, if you have to change the uh, medication. Uh, people take uh, their temperature to learn about ovulation for a possibility of pregnancy, many different reasons. And temperature has problems uh, that could be either too high uh, or, or too low, hyperthermia or hypothermia. I think uh, people have usually die at a temperature above 109 Fahrenheit. Some people have lived up to 115, but with damage. Uh, people have dropped down uh, and usually die under 80 or 70. I don't have the exact number right now, but um, and I'm giving in Fahrenheit. Uh, but some people have lived into the 50s, 57. Some people have lived and come back. They don't always come back as normal, though. <clears throat> and it's interesting that the body temperature, why we have a body temperature uh, of this rate. And some scientists, I read an article on this the other day, uh, so I can't totally prove it or not prove it, but they tried to figure out why we have a temperature of 37 or 98.6. And it has to do with a few things. It has to do with... Uh, with um, metabolism, basically, to make sure that all of the cell reactions and the chemistry that happens in our body that happens where an enzyme breaks something down from a protein uh, or from a ham sandwich into proteins, fats and carbohydrates, all of these products of metabolism have to happen at a certain temperature. And so that temperature seems to be about 98 uh, and also, one of the other things that this article talked about was that fungi or funguses, uh, if our temperature was much lower, then they might be able to grow in our body, which would uh, take us out. And then we'd have no vital signs. So uh, it's an interesting composition of figuring out what's the perfect temperature to be at that doesn't, that keeps fungi from growing, but also we don't have to overuse for our metabolism to uh, stay and maintain at a certain temperature. And it's fascinating the way the body uh, maintains a, a relatively narrow, normal temperature at, at all times, which is great. And they, uh, another article that I just read uh, that uh, talks about leptins. I don't know if you've heard of leptins, but many people are talking about them now having to do with weight gain and dieting, and it's a hormone in the body that increases appetite. Well, the, these leptins that are little hormones living in certain types of fat cells help to regulate the temperature by making someone hungry to bring in food, to bring in energy. So it's pretty fascinating the way it all plays out for each other. So uh, you can take a temperature orally, uh, rectally, you they now have, uh, as you alluded to a few moments ago, all of these uh, pieces of equipment that you could take a temperature on a forehead, inside an ear, uh, in a number of places. But what I recommend is that whatever you do, learn how to do it in the normal person first so that you recognize normal. And if you are using uh, some of the newer thermometers, make sure that their batteries are always working correctly and that they're clean and that you use them appropriately when you finish using them, clean them, and make sure they're put away perfectly so that uh, they'll be ready to use for the next time. And start to learn uh, what is normal at different times of day for your child and different activities. Mm -hmm. I, and I don't necessarily, I think that the most accurate, I would have to say, is probably the rectal uh, temperature. Um, 
Most people are not using the glass bulb thermometers with mercury anymore. Most people have uh, monitoring systems, especially if you have a child. But I always recommend that people, just like uh, we talked about uh, with Angela Salvucci about preparing for emergencies, I think everyone should have a thermometer at home at, and learn about their temperature. So those are the main vital signs. Those are pulse, blood pressure, respirations, temperature, and pulse oximetry. Yeah. And I wanted to talk about two other uh, things that I think people should assess in themselves and in other people. And they tried to do this in emergency medicine. They said that we, we weren't necessarily looking at pain uh, and we needed to evaluate pain more in people. Uh, and they tried to make this a vital sign, and I always argue with this because, as I said right at the beginning, a sign is something you can measure and monitor. You can't measure how much pain. Of course, of course, everyone will say, you know, on a scale of 10, I have minus 12. Uh, my pain is 12, and it really hurts. Everyone says that, but it doesn't really give us the true understanding of it. But I always feel that people uh, should assess their own pain level each day and assess pain levels of people they're taking care of and, and deal with that because being in pain is an important part of life. And although it's not a vital sign, it's a vital part of living, uh, to be pain free. And, uh, so I always recommend that people assess that we had these, uh, happy faces, especially for kids so that we could see a grouchy face all the way up to a happy face. And we would ask the child because they wouldn't always understand on a scale of 10, they could say, which of these faces describes the pain? And they could point to one. So we would at least get an idea of, of, of that process. Anything on pain? Uh, that's a whole other topic, but I just wanted to mention it uh, before we go on to our final uh, assessment, vital statistic. Well, I think I'm going to need to, uh, this is a good time right now to read some of the questions that came in. Okay. Um, uh, one of them, when you say fungus living in the body at certain temperatures, is this how jungle foot, rock wor foot rot works or frostbite? Frostbite and a fungus are different, uh, but uh, this is something that, just like we know that we have bacteria inside of us, but those usually are good bacteria and any of the bad bacteria are... Um, are not able to live or we have them under control with our immune system. Well, there could be funguses that might get into our body that we can take care of. Now, there are certain ones that get overwhelming uh, or that get onto our skin. That's a different process that I'm talking about. And frostbite has to do uh, with temperature, uh, but it has to do with a cold temperature and where the body reacts when it gets very cold outside uh, certain things happen. The blood vessels that we talked about uh, contract in the peripheral system so that any blood that can be moved around is protecting the vital organs like the heart, the liver, the lungs, the kidneys, the brain. So blood flow to the extremities and the skin decreases. And when that blood flow decreases, it allows tissue not to be protected and they get uh, exposed to either a fungus or a bacteria or a uh, temperature, and then the cell starts dying. Wow. Hopefully that answered that. Mm. Um, another question that had come in a little earlier. Every once in a while, I get a fluttering feeling in my heartbeat. Is this something to worry about? I've had it since I was a teen, and I always forget to ask my doctor. <laughs> Excellent. Great question. The first the first answer is go to uh, our episode on Inside the Doctor's Box of preparing for your doctor's visit. It's <laughs> a good one. And learn how to write down the questions and prepare yourself for the visit. So that answers the part about forgetting. Or if you have to, you can call your doctor and, and send the question in. But yes, you have to be concerned about it. If you start taking your pulse and you recognize that it's mainly normal, uh, then that's good. When you feel that fluttering sensation, take your pulse again and be able to try and figure out first, what is the rate? You know, how many beats per minute, just like we talked about. And if it's 
more than 100, then that's something to be concerned about. If it's less than 60, that's something to be concerned about. So you take the rate, then you take the rhythm. Is that fluttering regular or is it regularly irregular or, Christina, help me out. Irregular, irregular. There you go. So you take, <laughs> so you take that part of it and then you also take the quality part. Is it, it's not absent if you feel it. Is it weak? Is it bounding? Is it normal? So if you know those three things and you can tell your doctor, this is where I took my pulse, I took it on my wrist, or I took it up to my carotid artery, and this was the rate. The rate was 120. It was irregularly irregular, and I could feel it normal. And then you would tell them I had other symptoms, like I felt lightheaded and I was sweating a little bit and I had some chest discomfort that point, the doctor will want to be very concerned with you, and they will run some tests on you. Uh, but I think it's not something to worry about. It's something to first be concerned about and evaluate it. And then once you evaluate it, you may find out that you absolutely don't have to worry about it or that you should be concerned and do something. You also should look at certain times when the... Uh, what brought this fluttering on? Did you just finish three cups of coffee? Are you nervous before you're going on uh, to do a piano recital? Uh, did you just hear some bad news? Uh, did you just eat something? So try and look at a few things. So when you see your doctor, you can give them a lot of information, and then they can hone in on what this whole thing is about. Good question. Yes. Okay, it's time for me to start writing things down. That wasn't my question, by the way. <laughs> I right. just say my butterflies have moved from my stomach up to my chest. That's all. <laughs> there you go. Oh, how nice. It must be the uh, season of migration. Yeah. Well, it's, oh, no, Valentine's Day has uh, passed. I would have said it was the fluttering of wings. <laughs> uh, so the last, the last one I want to talk about, we talked about pulse, blood pressure, temperature, pulse oximetry, respirations, and then we talked about pain. The last thing I think we should always talk about uh, in assessing our vitality is about happiness. And we should take an assessment of our own happiness. Now, in a few weeks, we're going to be talking uh, with Marilyn Tam. She's an entrepreneur, a successful uh, consultant. She consults to corporations, institutions, governments. She's a humanitarian. And she's also an author who has just written a book called The Happiness Choice. And I'm going to try and find out how she correlates happiness and health. And we'll see if we agree on those things. I think we will. But I just wanted to bring that up and say that in each person's assessment, whether it be yourself, whether it be your child, whether it be a loved one or a friend, you should always find out about their happiness just like their pulse. They're, they're all important. And if they're not happy, it's the same as if their pulse is irregular. You should be doing things to bring on happiness. And if they're very happy, that's good. So I think that should also be part of it. And that's pretty much all I want to say today about uh, vital signs. So if you have uh, some other thoughts or questions or anything else I can chat with you about, I, 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 I love that final piece, Glenn, because uh, as a body worker, it's very clear when someone, because, you know, the hands are on the body uh, and we're working on the individual, when, when somebody is not happy, like honestly happy from their heart, you, uh, I can feel it throughout their body, um, their skin, uh, their tissue, it, and and it's almost like everything is is closes inward and and just gets very slow and lethargic. Um, whereas people who are truly happy from their heart, you can feel that energy just emanating through their skin, and you know, you, it's almost like you can feel their pulse without even touching them. That's absolutely right. I remember we spoke with Chao Pang, the uh, Tai Chi master who's talking about opening the heart and exercising to feel good and being happy. 
Well, we know that uh, the nervous system is affected by hormones, and hormones are affected by moods. So just by being happier, you can affect your vital signs. Mm-hmm. And you know what I find very interesting is, um, not to get off the topic, but it is on the topic of happiness, when people say that they're, they're not fully happy from the heart, uh, the, when you say, well, what do you like to do or, or what would make you happy? I'd say at least 50% of the time, people don't know. Or that's their answer. Mm-hmm. I don't really know. So, yeah. It's, well, that's part of the work that we all need to do. But I think um, for the sake of Magical Medical Tour and the uh, point of this show and Trinity and uh, Into the Flow with Anatara, uh, all of these have to do with health. Uh, and it's sometimes difficult to be happy if you're not healthy. Uh, it takes a lot more work and energy to be happy when you're not healthy. So that's part of the reason for this show is to bring about an awareness of health to such a degree that people will not just intellectually say, oh yeah, I like to be healthy, but they will actually take it into consciousness and make it about their whole life style uh, to be healthy. And today talking about vital signs is just a way of of as we use in the medical field, we can measure and monitor and follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you can find uh, things to measure happiness and monitor and follow it, then that that will um, inspire people, hopefully, to find things that do make them happier and to actually find what does make them happy to define that. I think we all have to figure out our mission and our visions, and uh, when we have that, that begins to make us happy. Mm, that's part of the vital signs. <laughs> well, it's the I, I don't. I have to be careful because I need to be true to myself and say that pain and and happiness are not signs, because we can't really measure and monitor them the same way we can measure a pulse or a mm. blood pressure. But we certainly can use them in the assessment of the vitality of a person. First, we can assess the vital signs of the vitality, and then we can assess uh, the pain, and we can assess the happiness. There may be other things, you know, I I think if we had the discussion with a number of people, they may want to add other things that should be assessed, and I'm Mm -hmm. okay with that. But um, I'm okay with this group Mm -hmm. for the moment. (laughs) So let me ask you a question today, uh, Christina. Yes. What did you learn? Well, I, I definitely learned the numbers of uh, the vital signs for the average on the pulse rate. You know, I, I know those at the back of my head somewhere, as I, I was saying earlier, but to actually spew out the correct average or numbers, uh, boo, even the body temperature, because I'm so locked into my own child's <laughs> daily body temperature. Right. You know, um, because I'm so used to seeing it that, you know, even for myself and, you know, what is that average now? Was it 97.8? Was it 98.6? You know, <laughs> those, those numbers were all floating in my head. Um, but uh, uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, learning about, you know, when we're hooked up to the machinery for our blood pressure and we have that little clip on the tip of our finger, which they're also, um, I'd never seen one of those smaller child units before until recently. They're so cute. And <laughs> the child or the unit, the unit, <laughs> not a child too, but the unit, you know, with the, with the smaller, uh, wrap that goes around their arm and, and the numbers are flickering. You know, I remember the days of, of, um, you know, the stethoscope, and uh, you wrap it, and then you have to put the stethoscope on, on the, the pulse by the, um, by the elbow joint. You know, I remember the those days. The fossa and the brachial artery. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you meant to it's say, connected right? connected to the wrist bone. <laughs> exactly. You know, and which I love. I love listening to the 
pulse, you know, through the stethoscope from there because, you know, my, my parents had that whole unit. And now it's so easy. You just you know, kind of wrap it around your wrist or something and you press a little button and voila, there are your numbers. <laughs> Yeah, it was very interesting for me in the emergency department because after I would introduce myself to somebody, um, the next thing I would do would be I would put my hand on their pulse, put my fingers on their pulse, and I would continue the conversation with them with my fingers on my on their pulse. And that seemed to do many things. It developed a human contact mm -hmm. between two two individuals, and it had connections. It also gave me information as I was speaking with them, and uh, I think it connected them more to me so that when we were conversing and I was trying to get as much information within the most limited amount of time possible to save a life, a limb, or a vision, uh, I got answers uh, that seemed very directed when I was staying in touch with them and their pulse. Mm, mm, yeah, the human touch. Right. That is and I love, I must say, I, I still, even to this day, I love taking a stethoscope and listening to a human heartbeat. It's fabulous. Yes, yes. And especially I, now with all the different systems where you can, you can look at the electrocardiogram and know what's happening electrically. You can look at a monitor with, if someone is under an ultrasound, you could see the actual uh, uh, chambers. Uh, squeezing down and relaxing. You could see the valves opening and closing, blood flowing in and out. It's fabulous. It's amazing. It's how, how everything's evolved. It's quite amazing. Um, I know. So we're up to the top of our hour. We are speaking with our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. And today we were in his doctor's bag talking about vital signs. So Dr. Woolman, what is your tip for us today? <clears throat> uh, well, uh, let me save that for the end. Uh, just before <laughs> I say goodbye, I would like to uh, thank all of my teachers and all of my healers to allow me to be on my journey. And I look forward to getting together with everyone, uh, including Christina, next week as we search another aspect of the healthcare galaxy. I think we're going to be talking with a person who uh, works with food and nutrition. Uh, it's going to be very interesting, I think. There's a lot of questions I have for next week. Uh, but I do look forward to meeting with all of you again in another quadrant. And my health tip for today, I think, to stay uh, along with the uh, theme, be vital. There you go. <laughs> That's going to be I a hope fun. That makes 2013. <laughs> <laughs> Under the health tip. <laughs> I hope I make it. Maybe I need to say more. No, I don't think I need to. I think be vital. That covers a lot of things. It does. It surely does. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Glenn Woolman. You have uh, expanded our knowledge that stage further, and now we're all going to be taking our temperatures <laughs> Good. And, and writing things down. It's so simple, and yet it's just creating the habit to do it, isn't it? Creating consciousness. Yes. And, and habits and patterns of behavior are things we will continue to talk about. I, I was hoping I would talk about a little bit about patterns of behavior today and how to change, but... Uh, maybe we'll save that for another time. Vital signs were just too vital for me yeah. to uh, <laughs> go into another area. <laughs> I wish everybody optimal health. Thank you so much, Dr. Woolman. And I would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We are grateful for your continuous support and look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. We invite you to join us live on Tuesdays for Magical Medical Tour at 10.30 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, 1.30 Eastern Time, Wednesdays for Trinity of Life at 11 a.m. Pacific Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, followed every other week with Flowing Into Awareness with Anatara. You can also contact Dr. Glenn Woolman at myyogahub.com forward slash gwoolman. Follow him on Twitter at Glenn Woolman and, of course, his own site at 
uh, glennwoman.com, where you can learn about his metaphor square breath. Until we meet again, namaste. Namaste.